Hello, this is Brian Foster on Kardak Radio, presenting the program Spiritism and the Spirit World Around Us. Hello, everybody, on a Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, all time in between and around the world. Tonight, we're bringing you another program, episode four of the appearances of Christ in the spirit realm. This is an exciting topic because we're seeing through the writings of the Reverend Jeeva Owen, we're seeing an aspect of Christ, of Jesus that we have never seen before. And that is, is what how does he manifest himself? What does he do? How, how are things seen with Jesus Christ in the spirit world? We know him on earth, but we see him in a whole different light on the other side. Tonight, also I wanna make sure we're here on Kardec Radio, the Facebook site, uh, streaming live. There are many other people here on Kardec Radio that are, have live streaming. Vanessa is only many times she'll so live stream many more times than I and others. And so I I would um, hope to tell everybody to tell your friends to uh, join Kardec Radio Facebook site and put the app of Kardec Radio on your phone, your Android or your uh, Apple device. You can just look up in the App Store. Look up Kardec, K-A-R-D-E-C, radio, and you can download that app for free. And you can listen to Kardec Radio 24 hours a day. It's all programs on spiritism. It's very enlightening. I listen to it constantly. It's it's excellent. And you can learn a lot. And then also, you can come. You can see here on my Facebook site, uh, on my live stream, you can, you can, if you want to learn more about spiritism, you can, first of all, I recommend for everybody, this is the head headwaters of everything, Alan Kardec, The Spirits Book. You can get that on my site, mwspiritism.com. You can click on his, Alan Kardec's picture up on the upper le- upper right, I'm sorry, upper right, it will take you to the EDICEI bookstore. You can buy the book. You can also buy it on Amazon and you can get all of it. Alan Kardec's were the main five books of his. You can get them in PDF version, so it doesn't cost you anything. And that is how I started uh, exploring Spiritism, as I found his writings in PDF. Didn't cost cost me anything. It changed my life. Again, so tonight, let's talk about Christ in the spirit room. So what we're going to tell you now is is on New Year's Day, the first day of 1920, the Spirit Arnell told the Reverend G. Vallon about his encounter was one of the manifestations of Christ during the whole in, during Christmas Eve in the spirit realm. And this really shows us as the you know as as we said before, and you know you'll see this in the uh, the writings by Francisco C. Xavier, uh, also called Chico Xavier, uh, who was a Great, great medium in Brazil, wrote more than 450 books, almost 500 books. And in the writings of him, uh, Yvonne Pierre and others, we learn that spirits, as the higher spirits go, the more the more the ratio of matter to energy, right? So the higher energy, the higher you go, the higher the ratio of energy to the ratio of matter. And of course, the converse is true as you as you go in the lower zone and, and the dark abyss, which the lower zone is the is the area it's right into earth crust all the way to, to the level of heaven where the uh, errant spirits are is you know they are more they're you know a higher racial matter than energy and as you go up so it just shows you the high spirit is just you know is an immense amount of power so and then of course these spirits um uh, didn't get there because they were born into it or they are other means they all they all every spirit you know even jesus christ was low like us right everyone who's a higher spirit higher angel what we've seen is everyone has deserved that they have earned the right to be there and as they continually progress that's what we are told is that heaven is not a place where you sit idle you are continually educated and you progress up the ladders right you're always learning more you're doing more you're serving people more so Arnell told him about what happened during Christmas Eve. And he was in the great hall in the high level of heaven 
with other spirits, as I said before, earned the right to live there. They resided in that sphere only after years of toil and hardships they slogged through as they ascended stage after stage of heaven. And he was in this hallway and he saw a child walking down the hallway, most beautiful boy. Arnell could not take his eyes off the splendor and purity of the child. Then a very high spirit took the child onto his right shoulder. Everyone in the hall recognized the child as Jesus. Now again, Jesus can manifest as any way he so chooses. So as and he came as this as the, to the gathering as the, as a representation of the innocent of youth. And as the tall spirit marched down the aisle with Christ on his shoulder, the child grabbed flowers. So then Arnell detailed his experience. This is what he said. When he came to me, he gave me a pansy. That's the most like flower you know. As I took the stem between my fingers, he held it for a very little minute and looked into my eyes the while. The effect on me was this. I felt that he knew me and loved me apart from all the rest. There was between him and me a bond which was not between him and anyone else. For some time past, I've been working strenuously at a problem whose solution had eluded me time and again. At that moment, I had the answer. As the child looked into my eyes, I saw in his own knowledge all of my patient and long inquiry in detail. Sympathy for my failures, approval at my perseverance, in love of me because I was I and no one else. That, as I found later by conversation, is what happened to all the rest. And the flowers we received were simply used, first as channels of his grace and benediction, and second as insulators between him and us. No one in that multitude could have touched his form. Now, listen to this. Theoretically, to have done so would have meant annihilation. Practically to draw so near to be as to be able to touch him was impossible. No one of us was so high a frequency as to attune with him. So think about that for a second. To touch him would have meant annihilation. And he was probably in that full power. And then also think about what you've heard in many people's um, uh, near-death experiences, NDEs. And that when they thought that they had met Jesus, now I would think a lot of these people who they think are Jesus are probably other high spirits, but they just felt that that Jesus knew them and loved them. They, they, they you, know, you hear many stories of people saying, I've never felt so loved before. And even spirits, high spirits in the spirit realm could feel that too. And, and but Jesus could peer into them and actually send them information to help them solve problems that have been vexing them. That, I mean, spiritism and, you know, through Chico Chaffier and, of course, in, you know, uh, this book, Heaven and Below, which is, uh, I've categorized the writings of Jivao and has brought us so much more information about the spirit world and, and Christ within the spirit world. And uh, to get an understanding is gives us a whole different view. And imagine... You know, imagine the feeling of love so powerful as to instantly create a deep connection where you feel acceptance, approval, and understanding all at once. When you feel absorbed in the body of Christ, which to you was unique, right? Where your mind ran a thousand frames per second and solved the vexing problem. All of this occurring practically simultaneously. In a few moments, one high spirit changed your outlook. You felt a connection to an exalted purpose. Such is the power of Jesus in the spirit realm. Imagine we are lucky enough to have him to be the governor, the leader of our planet. And he's also a governor and leader of other planets. But he is the one that set us in place in the solar system, set the whole history, the geological history, the millions and millions, billions of years of, of Earth present that is all caused by Jesus Christ. Now, when high spirits come to earth and are physically present, their spirits alter the composition of their bodies, right? So this is why, uh, depending on the manifestation of a spirit, that doesn't mean that you, if you ever touch them, you'll be annihilated, right? Their, their mind and presence is so powerful that matter will modify to their wishes. So when they are 
are, and so you can also tell high spirits, I believe, when when they come to earth, because now higher spirits only come to earth in, in, in you know, very seldom, you know, 400, 800 years. So there, so one thing I, I want to convey to people is these high spirits, they're, they are so powerful, and their pair of spirits so powerful that they are able to matter they are a, that matter will modify to their wishes, right? So when they are born, they are noticeably different, calmer, superior, and charismatic. Now, let's think of some examples: Socrates and Buddha, right? Both high spirits, but less, you know, less than Jesus. They came to Earth, made an impact that is still persistent thousands of years later. Now imagine Christ in the flesh, His presence, His empathy, His power. Knowing His force as a spirit makes it unremarkable that a child born into the family of a modest carpenter would change the face of history. Jesus could have appeared as a child of any social strata, nation, or race, and he would have made a titanic impact. His choice was made for the greatest effect for the world, and it is still reverberating. And Christ's love above all the residents of the bands of heaven circling the earth is fully revealed by Arnell's statement that he would be utterly destroyed by a mere touch. Jesus is energy. I don't know what his ratio is of if he has any matter or not, or if he is pure energy. He is concentrated energy on a cosmic level. Arnell's mixture of energy and matter would have reacted like a person being struck by a thousand lightning bolts or holding the cable with the total electrical output of the great energy generating dams of the world. The power would instantly incinerate whoever came into contact. Now think of it, each and every one of us is guided and touched by Jesus in some manner, whether by the direction of a spirit mentor or a guardian angel, via the broad directives of Christ. You can think of, of Christ as, as, you know, here on earth reading the Bible, we think of him as this wonderful, you know, calm, loving, empathetic person who is very wise and, and revealed a whole new world to us. And that is all true. There's a, but there's another angle. There's another perspective of where he is. He is is the CEO, the president. He is the leader of a dynamic spirit universe around the earth, just as part of one of his departments, you could say, who is leading our whole human race and each one of us through successive lives, all on the path from a planet of atonement to a planet of regeneration, and each of us individually to become one day a pure spirit. And know that this environment, society we present live in, has been molded and is still unfolding under his orders. Jesus has created the world we live in for the purpose of teaching us the value of love. It is for a reason we live on a world of chaos, of cruelty and madness. We must first learn what we must never do before we learn what we must do. Jesus is guiding all of humanity through successive incarnations so we may cast off our primitive emotions and characteristics in our quest to be pure. In our small, our own small world, we each have our own little battle over ourselves. Christ knows this, and he knows how to enable an entire phalanx of immature spirit to each experience their own little victories. Now, as he does this, there's other things. Now, there's another passage in the book from Reverend Zibao, and and this is where Jesus appears at the University of Five Towers. And what he did is he allowed the students there to explore the creative hierarchies of the universe. And at the end of the display, there was a closing ceremony, and it was a rousing call to action, a statement, a plea to not let one soul behind in the darkness. Now, I talked about what happened in, as he was at the University of the Five Towers in the previous episode. And I'll just really quickly say it again, is what, um, what the spirits have told us who talked to the Reverend G. Val Owen is that from levels one to 10, now these are just arbitrary levels, right? Other people use other, other naming uh, characteristics, attributes. But as, you, as these first levels of heaven they're all about teaching us, right? Teaching us about the process, the 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 facts of, of the spirit world, how we use it, you know, what do we do, etc. 
But then as you get above that, that 10th level, that, that, you know, to the 11th level, you really start, are, you, you are introduced to be a, a, a spirit that actually contributes, a creative spirit in some, in some manner, to actually help create other worlds, other animals, uh, guide other environments, etc. So at the end of the display where people got to see all this, what other higher spirits, of course, now all of this, now, now think about, think about Jesus as a CEO, right? Think about is what, what, what is he doing there? He is motivating. He's teaching people. He's saying, look, you're doing all this work. Here's what awaits you, right? And that's why Jesus will show, oh, hello, Rosalind, again, from Los Angeles. How wonderful. Um, when He's teaching, he's, he's motivating people. He's like someone who's really saying, okay, this is, you've worked hard, you've done a lot, but here, this is what's next. You know, it's all about self-motivation. No, again, we have free will. No one's going to say, hey, you have to go to college and you've got to take these classes. Now, if you want to go at, in the lower zone or level of, of heaven and park there for thousands of years, I'm probably sure you have you have the um, the option to do that. If, you know, but what they're trying to do is they, you know, high spirits visit you, you see these things and say, oh, I want to do that too. I want to, to learn that so I too can be of service and be of great help to other planets and other people and our own people. So this is what um, Arnell, who was a student at the University of Five Towers at the time, he describes what he saw. Round the throne in which the great Christ creative sat there appeared a cloud of vapor. Very beautiful it was to see it, as the colors invaded it and mingled with it like web and wolf. Then from the rear of the throne and of the cloud, there shot up a circle of rays, fan-shaped, spread high and wide, while he sat in the lower middle of them. They were of blue and green and amber. These rays were heavenly projections of those forces which are generated from the material departments of his realm the realm phenomenal and substance of matter of which the earth and planets and stars are made. Then the cloud in all in movement condensed upon itself in its various hues, so arranged themselves when it contracted to form a mantle. We saw them once again in their appropriate and relative places. For the mantle, when it had set itself down upon him and enwrapped his form about as he sat there, wrapped and was still very beautiful. This great piece of it was blue, dark and deep blue, but of brightness withal. The edging was of gold, and inside this edging was a border as it laid spread out upon the pavement and settled upon the steps. This border was of broad and gold, silver and green with crimson and amber in two broad lines of the boundary of it inward. The blue robe had it upon at large intervals, the semblance of a crown inverted, and it had a collar of pearl upon the shoulders of it. The color shone forth many hues. It was not pearl gray, but how shall I say to you? It shone from within and set forth rays about his head, not obscuring his face from us, but framing it in a halo of radiance. Viewed in perspective with the rayed background, it looked like the nucleus from which those rays issued forth. But this was not so, except that it appeared to us. Upon his head was no crown, but a circlet only of red and white, which bound his hair behind the ears. So this description by Arnell to the mind of Urban Chivaon painted an imposing picture of Jesus during his appearance at the University of Five Towers. <clears throat> Christ, framed as a magnificent king of humanity in his presentation to the spirit world, greatly contrasts with our perception of him during his time on earth. Again, as I said before, we saw him as a simple yet elegant in manner and speech without the need for extraneous finery. In fact, to most of us, seeing him in a grand manner would at first seem strange and unsettling. And many people have had near-death experiences reported Jesus who carries on with a simple tradition. I have not seen a description of excessive ostentation reported by a person who had an NDE. In other reports of spirits who have seen Jesus in the spirit realm have described colorful appearances, and they have also commented upon the aura of love and kindness, a perfection of balance, of male and female attributes, of expression of strength, yet caring. And I believe we should look at these descriptions as a mature spirit would. Jesus is the leader of a vast and a powerful organization. 
He commands enormous armies in his quest to perform good. Hence, he displays the majesty of his purpose. By demonstrating his beauty around his person and power of those who assist him, he is conveying the importance of his work to all the spirits in heaven. They are viewing the ceremony, absorbing the grandeur, with it the underlying foundation of love that Jesus has for everyone. This magnificent touches their own soul at a deep level and supplies a spark of motivation to keep up the fight, to be of service to those who need it. And the battle to enable each and every lost spirit to climb the ladder of perfection is not an easy task, as we all know, because we are, are those, right? We are here on the planet of atonement. And we, we must know, we must be very frustrating to work with. And then we hear of spirits who have been to earth, and then they have to return to the spirit world to recuperate. Confronting ignorance, hatred, and envy constantly is a challenging task. Remember when, when uh, in the books by Chico Xavier, when Henri Luis descends down into uh, Rio and he sees these black clouds, he sees, you know, people in buses and they're all covered, you know, with like black clouds around their head, which is all, it's again, it's, it's you know, jealousy and greed and hatred or, or plotting for revenge. It's, it's, you know, it's just, you know, that's what a, a spirit sees when he, when he or she comes down in, 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 into our plane, right? And sees us in this, in this cloud of, of ignorance, right? Therefore, the vast numbers of spirits and countless organizations requiring a shiny example to model their behavior. And this message is then hammered home by what happens next. Now, this is very interesting. So this is now this is what Arnell says. Now he arose and laid the ground upon the steps before his feet and stood the faces. While he spoke his will to us, he said, You have been but lately seen what toward within my kingdom. Yet there are who may not come, yet there are who may not come to look upon its inner beauties as you have done. In those far outlines, they are only able to dim thoughts to think of me. They are not yet come to their full awakening. Tell these friends, good Lamel, and Lamel was a, a spirit, of the present estate and coming destiny of those so far removed. So then, upon the first step of the throne, there stood a man who was of those you know, who attended and waited in silence on either side of the stairs. And he was clad in, in white, this is Lamel, with a silver belt upon his left shoulder and about his loins. He therefore spoke to us these words, and as he spoke to them, the voice of him seemed to be made up of many chords of music, not one note, but multiple. The tones were resonant so much that they floated in, forth into the air and passed above us until each note struck some gossamer string of music, and it responded. One and another aerial thong was thus set vibrating until the whole welkin was tremulant with music as if a thousand harps were at their business harmonic. Yet his words were not less clearly heard, but became the more tuneful and descriptive, more at one with the nature of the thing and acts they signify, more full of body and substance, as you should take a picture of black on white and turn into colors. So there was life in his song, not music only. So let's step back for a second of what Arnell told us. Imagine being in that throng and seeing this magnificent, you know, uh, address, right? So you have Jesus saying, you know, you're, you're here today, but there's a lot of people who aren't. There's a lot of souls who have not made this. There are billions of souls on the earth, below the earth, all who need help. So then Arnell says, okay, Lamel said, okay, he, start, he started addressing his theme. And this is what Arnell told us that Lamel said. What if the presence of him seemed to be far removed away in yonder high realms of glory? Here he is with all, for we are progeny of him, and in his life we live. What if we be to them afar down in those lands where light is dim as he to us? They be our brethren still, and we to them akin. What if they know not where their life is hid, but by which they live and live amiss? They fill and grope and grip but one small quarter, yet they do at least in this 
Orion and stretched her hands all blindly hitherward with palm upturned. But as but in the night they stumble and they stray into the byward tracks. Their onward course is hindered. Yet yet while they who see a little await the return of those errant who still see, see less, and they come forward slowly, but as in one company together. What if the way be long? Shall we not also await their coming hitherward, that they and we may move together onward, upward, but more gently, blessed in mutual love, so giving and receiving each other to both? Yet shall we wait, and only wait, while they towards us stumble on their way? Or shall we go and bring them, as the Christ sometime put off his robe of glory, and clad in lowly garb and workaday, sought out those sheep, who strayed as those do stray, and brought to earth what earth would solve that time ago. That this should be the powers on high made marvel, and they who hover over the cosmoid greater than this of our bowed low before him, as reverence do, they made obedience to the Son of God in his humility. For they are so great in wisdom learned, now more greatly still how love was fashioned for the universe, and the whole universe is both lovable and of love. So what if he be high from whom is all? We have his Christ. What if there be beyond below these more distant set than we? The Christ reached them too. What if they be weak of limb and dim of sight? He is their strength and he shall be their lamp to lead them. So they stray not much over nor be lost. And if they do not know these brighter realms, as we know them to our joy, someday they shall rejoice with us, and we with them someday. But which of us shall take the crown with strength appointed to this war? Who shall essay to place it on his head? For it is dull and heavy in its weight today. Yet let him who is strong and simple in faith stand here and take the crown. What if it now be lusterless, if some day be radiant with the light which now hid within it? When the task is made complete some day. So then there was a great silence when he had ceased, and only the vibrations of music ambient about us hovered still, wistful and, ca and caressing, loath to still themselves in the silence until the singer had been answered. Then, when no one came forth, none daring this high venture, the Christ himself descended and took up the crown and placed it on his head and it sank very deep upon his brow for it was very heavy yes my son it is heavy upon him today but there is now beginning to show a luster about it which it had not then so he stood and called to us and who will go forth with me of you my brethren and when we heard his voice we knelt one of all of us beneath his benediction so imagine oh i see uh, my, uh hello from brazil from from uh Mayara borges so think of this is this is what Lamar told everybody. What he told everybody in, in essence is a call to action from the Lord, right? From, from Christ, the one who formed our planet, guided the evolution of the earth so humans could appear. So that we, immature and primitive souls, that you know, you're looking at me, could have a vehicle in which to become civilized. And this call to action, it was beautiful. And it actually reminded me of a speech written by Shakespeare for Henry V. In the famous, oh, Sandra from Germany. Thank you, Sandra, for showing up. It reminded me of a speech on the Henry V in the famous St. Christmas Oratory from the battle before Agincourt, which is, we remember, was a famous English uh, battle where the English were outnumbered and they actually defeated the French. And this is what uh, Shakespeare wrote, his very short speech. This is what Shakespeare wrote. Be in their flowering cups, freshly remembered. The story shall, shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin, Crispian shall ne'er go by. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition, and gentlemen in England now abed shall so think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. 
And, you know, this is another, you know, beautiful motivational speech. And both Henry and Lamel's speech were beautiful calls to action. Both a reminder that something great and wonderful is about to happen. And one would be fervently desire to be a part of it. While Henry is a king of England, a known leader and warrior, Christ is to us close to his majesty and awesome power of God. To be asked to be part of his great vision is a request that none of us would ever reject. Quite the opposite. We would feel a stirring in our heart, wishing to go forth into the battle for souls with every fiber of our being. And think of that. Think of how that feels to be here, uh, uh, you know, a person who's exploring spiritism, who has read about spiritism, who understands that what, what does spiritism mean? Again, let me you know, show you. This is where it started, Alan Kardec's The Spirit Book, which, which tells us, in essence, we are immortal souls. We are here on this planet of atonement. What does planet of atonement mean? We're here to learn to be civilized. You know, look at us, and even Emmanuel said, just look at us like an elementary school. We're learning how to behave. We're, we're trying, we're shedding our primitive actions, our primitive, primitive selfishness, our desire, you know, our, our ego, our pride, which all of us, you know, especially me, still have a hard time, you know, getting rid of. But, you know, we're learning that. We're learning to love other people and we're learning to look at other people, not as that person in that little speck of time, which is now. You, no matter how flawed they may be, but to look at that person in this arc, right? This arc of from a primitive spirit all the way to a high spirit and that everything they do or is being done to them and to us is planned. Why is it planned? It's planned for edification. It is planned that we improve. And this is what Lamel was saying is, is that all these plans and that all these spirits is that there's all sorts of work for them to come to us and say, and say, look, you need to learn this. You need to learn this and you need to improve yourself. And Lamel's words and Christ's actions are a clarion call that all of us, even those of us in the most humble circumstances, are able to assist fellow human to raise their head toward the perfect white light to see the path of perfection. Now, there's another very interesting uh, section, and that is, again, a, another look at Christ. And this is, this is how uh, Arnell starts this. Then, after a long ecstasy of wonderment and great uplifting at the sight of so much power and glory, we begin to feel within us a glow which suffused us with a sense of love and pity and an access of resolve to put of our best into what work lay ahead of us. So we knew that he drew near in person. And again, so High Spirit Arnell spoke to the mind of Reverend Zivala, who described his contact with the power of Jesus during a great endeavor to bring light and love to earth. So I, I'm, again, we're talking about another aspect of Jesus. This, this is, Jesus is always here. Jesus is his, his representatives. His, his assistants, whatever we want to call them, different groups, different departments, are, are in constant contact with us, guiding us. And it's up to all of us to read and study and learn about this. And I tell you, as the more you learn about spiritism, the more you can start detecting the signs and signals of when things, when you're doing the right thing, or when it's like, okay, that door is closed. I probably should go that way, right? It's very subtle. And it's if you really start, but the more you study, the more you 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 humble yourself and you see which way life is, is doing. So with some things like you have this plan and and this plan just like works, like boom, boom, boom. You know that's that's probably the spirit world facilitating that plan. Or when you have a plan, you think it's good, and it's just like one hurdle after another. Now, I don't want anybody to say give up too easy, right? Because that's part of learning too. But it's just like when when you just know that this should not have been so hard, right? And it happens over and over and over again. Uh, you know, it's something wrong. Let me give you an example of that. 
uh, my wife and I wanted to sell our house here and we wanted to move to a different house. It's like any here on Bainbridge Island where we have our meetings. Every time we were always like second or third. We were always too late. And we said, okay, well, evidently we're not able to buy a house, right? And we, I can't tell you how hard we tried. It's not that it shouldn't be that hard to buy a house, right? Then we look for vacant lots. Every time something stood in our way. We said, okay, evidently we are not meant to leave for this place, but we wanted a better house. But what dawned on us finally is that even the vacant lots were about what our, our, our loan was back, you know, on our house. So we just tore down our house and built another one in the same place. So, I mean, those are subtle signs of an example of how you're guided. And it's really the small examples that really are sometimes are the most powerful, not the big examples. So Arnell was participating in a vast and organized mission to Earth, right? And the reason was, and this is very interesting, they show you the things that happen without our knowledge, right? We see Socrates, we know of Buddha, we know of Jesus, we know of John the Baptist, you know, we uh, we know of these people coming to Earth, Lao Tzu, uh, Confucius, these these wonderful people coming to Earth and trying to say, this is how you should behave, right? Zoastra. Uh, but there are other things. There are other things on a psychic level that, you know, we don't really see. And it was to clean the psychic atmosphere and flood the planet with waves of compassion to light the flame of spirituality within each individual and managing a great multitude of spirits on different levels and capabilities to enable each of them to perform the task assigned and to do it with their utmost ability is a Herculean task. Now, we have to remember, spirits aren't beings of unlimited power of endurance. Spirits are people. They are us. They are who we are after we leave this physical form. Humans are human-like from other planets who have experienced many lives and request to become better souls. Hence, they require, like we do here when we work for a company, we require direction, support, and some motivation. Because don't you want a motivated workforce? So, and, and like us, frail beings on Earth, they need rest periods to recover from the long days of work. But there's an added dimension to the relaxation and recuperation. They will actually be given extra power, increased supremacy and capabilities, so they may return to the battlefield more ready and proficient than before. So Arnell tells us at the time during this great enterprise, he and a group of spirits were gathered in the parklands around the Tower of the Angels in the City of the Five Towers, and the city was on the 10th level of heaven. He and many others were in the middle of a grand mission mentioned previously, right? So when slowly angels of high degree begin making themselves visible to the audience, as they took their places, a cross rose up. Then another high angel came and leaned on the cross and made this speech. Well, this is very interesting. This is what that high angel said. High above these, these you know, pretty high spirits on the 10th level of heaven. We have called you, my comrades, that you should hear the message of him who draws near the state in order that his advent and his passing, you understand what those should be to you and lose no blessing. Know you, therefore, you have seen him times again, that now he comes in another guise. Have you, as you have seen him hitherto, he came for some one purpose or another in special phase of person as special need required. Now he comes not in his fullness truly, yet in much greater fullness of majesty that sometime he came. For then he descended to you upon his business peculiar. Now he comes with the mandate of his father to the work. So this is a hint that God is actually is actually you know giving some somehow I have no idea commands of saying this you know this is what I want and so in the angels are saying it comes with the mandate of his father to do the work. Now I'll continue on the quote. It is an emprise of great moment for the earth is in sore need of you to help. When therefore he passes by you, do you, each and every one of you, bespeak of him what qualities you most do lack. So you shall become attuned to the task in hand and strengthened to its accomplishment. 
Be not unready, nor overawed too much of his glory. He brings it for you. He himself has no such need. It is for you he comes all glorious, and the beams of his radiance are for you. Bathe you in them, and therefore, and appropriate to your use, what of strength and ennoblement they carry in their magnetic forces. Now make for yourselves small companies for friendly conversation. Speak to one another, what have I have said to you? My words have been few, make them into many, and where you stick, these my companions will help you resolve your difficulty. So you shall be at ease the more when he shortly comes and why he passes you seeing and hearing and feeling shall also understand. Isn't this just, isn't this a fantastic peak of, of Jesus? You know, he, he's, he's, you know, and here he's, he's, he's like a, uh, a company commander or a project manager. You, you could, you know, say anything. You say, okay, here's the resources. Now I want to know what each of you need to do the job. And he has the power to facilitate that growth or, 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 or that extra power, knowledge to do that. So Jesus, on a mandate from God, the very phrase triggers a mystical connection to our deep conscience. No matter the degree of spirituality one has, to think that God is concerned about our tiny planet in the far outpost is in one of the many universes has to touch us deeply. Spiritism tells us that high angels, great lords of spiritual purity, are able to receive direction from God. Jesus, in his own words in the New Testament, has told us the same. In reading the message from the Spirit, speaking about his encounter with Jesus on one such mission is really revealing. Hearing about one instance of an order descending from a level which we have no concept to Jesus, to spirits in the spirit realm surrounding earth, puts definition which heretofore have been mere conjecture and supposition. It also doesn't it sound like normal when put into an order? Yeah, well, the the president of the company told me to do this, and I'm here uh, telling you what to do, right? And the process is similar. Why not? Because, of course, we've all been told that our physical world is a poor reflection of the spirit world. You know, why would things be completely strange? There are, many things are completely different, but a lot of the process and stuff are what we are used to. So while the processes are similar, the means are world apart, but it serves to provide a connection between our understanding of the afterlife and our life encased in our physical cocoon. God commands. Jesus is moved to action. He directs his minister. He reviews plans. He tracks progress. He motivates and empowers his, angel, his workers. This is a glimpse of the realm you shall inhabit one day. The same on one level and vastly different on so many other levels. So, Arnell, now, first I want to say this, this, this was all done in the 1910s, 1920s. And so, it also, also I want to show to you is, is this psychic cleansing, this, this, this sending us of, of wanting to be attuned uh, more spiritually. These things are like waves, right? This, this doesn't take, you know, Oh, yeah, next month, everything will change. These things are just like glacier slow to us. Because here we on Earth, we think a year is like forever, right? You know, in our culture now, two seconds, you know, waiting for the Internet to download is, is forever. So we have to we have to we have to know that the time frame is completely different. And we also know as spiritists, we know that we we're beginning the phase of coming from a planet of atonement to a planet of regeneration. Now, is that going to take 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, a couple thousand of years? I have no idea. So, but understand everything is, is, is you know, the, the time frame to us is totally different. We, we, we can only look at a, a very small time frame. And remember, we're immortal souls. We have many, many lives. So, so Ar Ar Arnell met with his friends and consulted with the angels amongst them to be ready for Christ's arrival. And the, the group waited patiently. They watched a mountain range in the distance. Its normal lighting was a crystal bright and a gold, green golden hue. And when the light beaming down the mountains turned to red gold and waves of colors rippled through the atmosphere, every new, one knew that Jesus was coming. Arnell describes the unfolding scene. They were outlined against the cloud of light in which the Christ himself moved forward. 
They were of very glorious and of mighty stature, as of strength to match. Men and women they were, and one here and there was a dull angel, two and one. I leave it there. You would not understand that mystery, nor could I put it in words to, for you. They were neither bisex nor sexless. Let it rest there. They were very lovely to see, but of softer mane than men, and more queenly than the women, their companions. So let's kind of go from there for a second and talk about these two and one, these dual angels. I've read about these dual aspects entities before. They were described as soulmates, as two personalities united, perfectly balanced between male and female, aggressiveness and passiveness, action and caring, all the best aspects of either sex combined and in harmony. How they evolved to that state and whether it is permanent or what is the ascending path, I do not know. What is certain is that attaining a harmony of female and male characteristic is vital for us to ascend. And for some, the road to unification is different. A male-oriented and a female-oriented spirit may meld together. They could have anticipated their eventual union with the divinity and begin that part of the process early. I do not know. This is all conjecture on my part. But this is what's great about what, when you read what the Reverend G. Valowin, right, is told by the spirit. And this is why, you know, I had to read his books quite a few times. You get these little nuggets of information, these little clues, right? And then you start diving down and it makes you think even more. Okay, so let me go forward with what Arnell actually saw. So he continues, the company passed forward to all these dual angels. Therefore, in the condition of our state and filled the whole firmament with their light and glory, they did not descend amongst us, these. They hovered above, dropping upon us the dew of their sweetness and peace. So light as kissed, Kisses wafted to us on a summer breeze, but full of power and charged with understanding of mysteries very deep and holy. As these tokens of their love fell upon us, we became enlightened in manners hitherto beyond our range. And so we were made more competent for our work. Now, think what happened. Imagine standing in the park when a group of glowing angels fly above you. They stop and look down, whereupon a dusting of sparkles floats through the air and reaches you. And as you breathe in, you feel increased strength and intelligence. This is more like a passage from an outlandish fantasy novel or a comic book, but no, it is a scene from heaven. Notice too, Arn Arnell chooses the word into the condition of our state. He didn't say arrive from a different territory or planet. Hence, Jesus and his angels came from another dimension, another plane, a different state of existence, a different harmony, a different vibration, a place where inferior spirits couldn't travel, and if they could, couldn't discern objects due to the brightness and the overwhelming reflections of love from superior beings. Hence, heaven's only boundary is really in our imagination. It is a world where thought creates, not one's own thought, but collective thoughts determined by the law of affinity where spirits gather with like a common creation, a common atmosphere is experienced, all governed by a set of divine laws, which allows for unheard of diversity, but maintains order. Because a lot of times you'll see people say, well, heaven's in your own mind. Yeah, it, it, when you die, you create your own heaven. Well, that's partly true. But think of the disorder and chaos, even with heaven, where you have Every these little different individual heavens. No, it, that's what the law of affinity, it, it lends, it, we're, none of us are, are islands by ourselves, especially when we're in the spirit world. Then we really feel the thoughts of others, right? Even here in our physical bodies, we are based in thoughts of others. We hear them subconsciously. But you're, you, as the law of affinity, we become like with like. And so then our own imagination and our own feelings becomes entwined with others. So we share a heaven. And as we share, and as we improve, we share higher and higher heavens. So, and then as, after the reinforcement of their powers, the spirits waiting in the park fully viewed and felt the presence of Christ. This is what Arnell said. His circumambient radiance increased in its brightness and expansion until we were all enveloped within it. I could see my companions even to the furthest bounds quite clearly. But all the air was tainted rosy gold. Our bodies also were bathed in its liquid flood. So he enveloped this hole in several. It was within his presence and personality we stood. And we felt not it, but him in and around us. 
We were in and parts of the Christ. And yet, although he thus became universal to us, he did not eschew to appear in outer form. I saw him as he moved about above and among us. It is very hard to tell you. He seemed to be everywhere at one time in his bodily localized form. And yet there was but one of him. I cannot say it better. It is not very well said for Thus. So he appeared to us. I doubt me much. He was not seen in detail of character by each one of us identically. To me, he appeared as I will tell you. He was very large of stature, some two men high, but he did not seem to so. To say giant would be to say the wrong idea in total. He was just a man, but a man in noble in aspect, as in build. Very well. Then upon his head he wore a crown, just a broad band of continuous blending it with a ruby stone and a medal of gold, alternate. The rays were not intermingled, but the ruby rays were red and the gold rays were golden. These went upward, ever expanding to heavens, and were caught upon the robes of those who hovered there, which became much beautified, beautiful, beautified by them. So, what, what did Arnell tell us? His aura filled all available space. The very air was infused with his presence. Hence, he permeated the entire park and at the same time was recognizable in form. The immediate effect of his presence was electric to all, far beyond what we could experience on earth by being in the presence of the most talented, revered, our famous person. Jesus not only, Jesus not only spread power, but covered all like a blanket with his boundless aura. An impression that raised consciousness and feeling so that never before had life been so in focus and inner determination so strong. Arnell tells us of his appearance, tells us more. His face is very solemn and pitiful. As he first went to one company, then to another, it never seemed to leave that central place where first we beheld him in visible form. We could read his countenance like an unrolled script. The solemnity in it came from realms ineffable, where sin is not unknown, but known only as a fact and not as an experience. The pity came from Calvary, and the two meeting midway between those were caught in the hands of the Son of Man divine, who, raising his hand to shade his eyes, that he might look into those far high realms to see what they would do with man for his usefulness. Let fall upon his brow those drops of sin from the earth to shallow his face into greater beauty. So we were sublime sublimity and sorrow blended one, and pity emerged the offspring born, hence to be an attribute of divinity. Then there was love, not that which delights to give or take, but love in which into it bosom gathers all and becomes one with all, identical. So did he envelop us and gather us into himself at this time. So this is the person, Jesus, our Christ, who is our leader, who guided the formation of our planet and the evolution of all life and the construction of bodies fit for our souls to temporarily inhabit so that we may spend one more lifetime learning to become pure like him. Arnell, who has seen Jesus many times, well knows the heavens and he, can, he constructed surrounding the earth, fully realizes the caliber of our leader. This is how Arnell closed out this message to the Reverend G. Bao Owen. For awful as it was to him in his spotless purity of holiness to look upon that horror there below, yet he paused not nor shrank from what he had taken in hand. Calm and invincible, he approached the conflict for the purification of a world, and we knew that in him we should prevail. No such leader ever was so great as he, my son. He is captain thoroughly, and not the less because there is very much of motherhood, motherhood in his heart. So all this is just amazing information to come from the Reverend Zivalwan. Again, I want to tell everybody, the Reverend Zivalwan is not much well known. And I'll say it quick. He was an Anglican vicar. He's not much well known in the uh, in other parts of spiritism. He was he wrote in England. He was a spiritist. I I uh, discovered the Reverend Zivalwan when my wife read the book Voltaire. Now, I, I heard that it was coming in English, but I haven't seen it yet. But my wife said, you need, you need to look at this, at, at this list. And I, you know, of course I ignored her at first and said, no, no, look at this list. And this was a list of people who were at this, I don't know what to call it, this gathering convention party of spirits 
uh, who had had worked hard for spiritism, you know, and there was like, uh, you know, all sorts of, of, of well-known names, mostly, mostly, uh, you know, Latin sounding, you know, Brazilian, Portuguese names. And on the very bottom of this list was Reverend G. Val Owen. And it's almost like, the, it's a, if you look at the book, it's almost like, I think it's the last page of the book. Of course, the book was Portuguese, so I couldn't read the whole book because, I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to read Portuguese. And so I looked him up, and then I found his books. And he never said in his books he was a spiritist, but he was, because everything he has is in tune with spiritism. And it proved that he was in named, and he actually named several times within the book, uh, Volte. Uh, and this was just amazing. So this is why I, his writings, his communications, just give you another whole view. And they're very interesting. And so what does this tell us? What was he telling us about Jesus? So growing up in, in, in my adulthood, early adulthood, and probably late adulthood, too, I felt that Jesus was a special person. And how else could one describe a man who nonviolently lived and changed the world? While it is true that religious institutions took his name and corrupted it for power, that never made me feel that Jesus was responsible for the evil committed in his name. But still, I felt he was just human like the rest of us, although an except, exceptional human. And now through spiritism, I know that, yes, he was born of a mother on earth, but he was in no way normal. His enormous willpower and love as an exalted spirit came into play the moment he was conceived. His mind and body had the capacity that we cannot conceive of today. The great Brazilian medium, Francisco Chico C. Xavier, had the power to merely place his hand on the book and know its content and the mindset of the author when he or she wrote it. He could read minds. He could see the future. All of this is recorded by his friends and co-worker. It still amazes them today when they think about it. Now, think about what people, how they've looked at Chico, right? Imagine what the apostles thought of Jesus, who could surely do more than Chico Xavier. It is no wonder they were completely captivated by him. And that Judas, probably amongst other apostles, must have thought him capable of defeating Rome single-handedly. Of course, this was not his intent. He came to lay one more brick in the foundation of our collective education. He came to tell us that earth was just a point in time and place and that we would rise to a different location, much greater and more fantastic than we could ever realize. But first, we had to change from selfish creatures to giving, from jealous to supporting, and from hating to, love, to loving. Little did I realize that Jesus was so much more than a presence on earth for his short lifetime. He is constantly with us. He permeates the very atmosphere of our planet and his rays of love extend to everyone. A person's religion doesn't matter, Jesus, for all are loved and all are guided to a path to achieve a higher state. Christ and his minions have laid out a life plan for each and every one of us. It is up to each individual to determine to follow that path with determination or not. If we choose to ignore the lessons thrown at us, then that is our failure, not his. If we learn throughout our ordeals and emerge a better person, then he rejoices with us. He is untiring in his work, and work it is. For he leads a vast and complex organization dedicated to our salvation. This is the side of Jesus we have not seen until spiritism brought us these revelations. He is not only a beacon of light, but also of order. He stands at his pinnacle, commanding ministers and armies of spirits who spread his word to every corner of his domain. Our Christ, for he is our, as a son or daughter of believes, appearing as theirs, combines love, intelligence, wisdom, empathy, compassion, focus, and an astounding competency and perfection in all that he does. And he does this for us. So, I hope that that helps everyone get a different view of Christ in the spirit realm. And it is, is, isn't it just fascinating of, of, of what is shown to us by the Reverend G. Valwan? And, 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 you know, there, there's hints of, of Jesus. Again, I want to tell everybody, this is the, you know, a great book that everyone should read. Again, I will say it's in PDF. And on my website, nwspiritism.com, you can click on Alan Kardec's picture and you'll be taking the EDIC uh, 
bookstore. And I think, I think this costs, um, nine dollars. You can buy it on Amazon, but it's more expensive actually. So they deliberately keep the, the price of this book, uh, pretty low. Um, and so I'd recommend you, you buying it from there. It's got, uh, the other books in English, uh, for, you know, translated from Portuguese, uh, for spiritism. And of course, I would recommend all of them. And I read anything that comes out in English. It's all fascinating. And I, I just look forward to it every time. So I want to end this. I want to thank everyone. I'm hoping this brought you interesting information that you can think about. And it, you can you can look at like, oh, you know, the spirit is opening my eyes. I'm, I'm seeing why I'm here. I'm understanding why bad things happen to me sometimes and good things happen to me. And none of this, I want to tell, repeat this, None of that is ever punishment. It's all for edification. We may not like it. Like a two-year-old, right? You draws on the wall and you put them in the corner and they cry. And, and it's like, well, you know, they'll get over it. But they have to learn not to draw on the walls. That's what happens to us, right? You know, we think it's horrible. But remember, we're immortal. And we live forever, right? That's the meaning of immortal. So it's just all for edification. I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you so much. And I will uh, end our program now. I would like to thank everyone for listening to our program on Kardak Radio and to point you in a direction to find more information about the spirit world around us. You can visit my blog at www.nwspiritism.com. Again, that is www.nw, as in Northwest, spiritism.com. And if you are ever in the Northwest, I certainly would welcome to have you come to our meeting on Bainbridge Island near Seattle in the state of Washington. Many blessings to all of you, and please continue to explore spiritism and the spirit world around us.